Ian, your blog today was a response to the weekend statement from the SNP about the ring fenced fund. I've been trying to go back to the genesis of this, and I found James Kelly of the Labour Party was mentioning this in 2017. Um, were you aware it went that far back? Yes, I, there's been two appeals. My understanding is there were two separate appeals to create this ring fence fund. The first being in 2017, and then a second one in 2019. I think the 2017 one approximately raised about 400,000, and the, two, the, the, the 2019 one raised uh, the remaining few hundred thousand. Now, that, that 2019 one, was that the one called Yes, Scott? I don't know. I, I've only seen the documents that were put out. Yes, one of them was called Yes, Scott. Uh, and it was quite clearly an attempt to widen the fund ba raising base further than just the SNP membership itself. And of course, that's why there was this ring-fenced terminology used. It was to give assurance to people that who were not members but who may wish to contribute to the Yes campaign that uh, the money would not be used for SNP purposes. It was ring-fenced solely for the use in NDRF2. Back to the National, Ian. Today's front page reads like a statement from Schrodinger's cat. The infamous fund we all donated to appears to exist and to not exist. Well, I mean, it's just like the money. The money's supposed to exist and doesn't exist either. I mean, the story here changes by the minute. The original story was that the money was ring fenced, it was going into this account. Uh, people, you know, contacted the SNP uh, and were told, yes, there is a ring fence fund. No, I'm terribly sorry. We can't give you your money back because we don't have access to it. Well, I, I hold emails from Ian McCann, the Chief Operating Officer of the Scottish National Party, no. which he sent to people, where he stated categorically there is a separate account. Unfortunately, the SNP don't have access to that account. Therefore, sorry, you can't get your money back. Now, it's as clear as that. <laughs> and that position lasted for a long time until such times as people started reporting to the police. And at that point, the policy changed. Yeah. Suddenly, of course, you can get your money back. Uh, Nicola appeared on the television and insisted, you know, that, you know, there was always only one account. There was never a ring-fenced account. It was always mm. in the SNP's general account. And she couldn't imagine how people got this impression that there was actually a ring fest account. <laughs> well, you know, she should have phoned me because I was holding the emails that were coming from SNP headquarters telling donors that that was the case. But, I mean, the level of deceit goes much further here because Nicola's never been off the TV trying to put out fires on this issue for mm. weeks and end now. And she always mentions the Electoral Commission. But if you read the Treasurer's explanation, you know, he's trying to deceive there as well. You know, the, if you were a charity, there's a regularity, a, a regularity that you've got to stick in your accounts where you just you split up restricted and unrestricted funds. That's part of the audit rules if you're a charity. The Electoral Commission say political parties can operate on that as well. But the SNP took the decision not to operate on that basis, which is perfectly legal. They're legally entitled not to do it. What they're not entitled to do, though, is then go on television and tell everybody that this fund is absolutely safe because they have to audit it and send it to the Electoral Commission. Well, the Electoral Commission's got no expectation whatsoever to be able to audit between restricted and unrestricted funds because the SNP opted out of that form of auditing. So Nicola's assurances were patently false. They were there, I believe, to mislead and provide false assurance that there was some ongoing checking 
about what was happening with these funds. So basically, it was an exercise in smoke and mirrors. That that clip. Was, I, 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 th I think that's the case. I mean, the bottom line is not everyone in our country, unfortunately, understands accounts or are familiar with the terminology and what goes on. But you know, there's enough in this country that are involved in business to know for sure that you know this is not right. This is not the way a business would operate. This is not the way. Uh, a political party should be operating. Uh, and, you know, why they didn't just come clean? And that, that's what I mean. I mean, there's all sorts of um, ideas of where this money went. It may have went back to the weirs. That's a possibility. Yeah. It may have been spent in the general election in 2017. That's a possibility. It may have been used to cover Alan Smith's legal expenses and damages to UKIP after he made a fool of himself. That's a possibility. But what's absolutely clear was it wasn't spent on NDRF2. <laughs> you know, and that's what it was raised for. Yeah. So there's clearly been a breach of trust here. And, you know, I fear that, you know, even after this latest um, essay from the National Treasurer, and I mean, he, this guy's got track record of it. I mean, he was the author of the money's woven through the accounts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we somebody wrote that, you know. Yeah, yeah. The SNP are still living with it. So mm -hmm. why they think he was the guy to front up the latest attempt to mislead, I don't know. It makes no sense to me. You've gone through the statement, Ian, uh, uh, point by point. Now, the front page of The National has this quote, SNP issue full explanation of where money raised in 2017 is, where it is, in response to claims that it had gone missing. Party reveals intention to use it this year, with a new fundraising campaign being looked at for 2022. Ian, of, of, of the, all the points that you go through here on, uh, on your list, what are the ones we should really be looking at? Well, you should be looking at number eight, because number eight is the one where there's an admission of the money not being there anymore. And what the treasurer's trying to do there is to project the idea that money that is no longer within the control of the SNP is still there because they've left a IOU in the tin uh, where they've inverted commas, earmarked uh, the money at some future date once they've raised it again. Uh, the, key, the key argument here is the difference between ring-fenced and earmarked. <laughs> Ordinary punters are not, you know, they're not supposed to look at that. You know, ring-fenced, earmarked. Ring-fenced means you can't touch it. Earmarked means it's probably not there, but, you know, if it does turn up, it's earmarked to go here. Completely mm. different things. Yeah. And it's a slight of speech that's yeah. being used there. Yeah. I mean, he, he actually goes on, I think it's point nine, he goes on to suggest that he's going to allocate this money, uh, you know, into this new NDRF unit. But you can't allo allocate money you've not got. The money's not there. The accounts prove it's not there. So this talk of reallocation is nonsense. What he's actually saying is, I'm going to use future fundraising future funds and direct them into that, that particular unit and, you know, that will pay out at that point. But that's just an accounting trick. Mm. I mean, what that ha what you do there is uh, overall expenditure goes up, but what you do is you change the cost centres. So you take some existing SMP expenditure, wages, salaries, whatever, and you move them in to the NDRF unit. Hmm. Now that has the effect of reducing that outstanding balance that's missing because you're paying it. It's getting paid out of SNP general funds. Hmm. But I mean, it's overall spending of what, but if you go and look at headquarters salaries and costs, they'll drop a bit because money's going in from people that would normally have been paid through that will now be getting paid through this NDRF fund inverted commas, accounting entry. And that will hopefully 
reduce the balance. That's the SNP's hope that people don't catch on to that. But it's an old trick. It's been used many, many times before. Yeah. Regarding uh, salaries and the SNP, Ian, has it always been the, 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 the situation where we do not know what uh, SNP officers are, are paid? I mean, no well, one seems I used to, to know what Mr. Morell is earning. Well, I, I used to be the vice convener in charge of administration and fundraising in the SNP. And I can assure you, when I was in charge of administration, I knew the salaries of every single employee. So that's a change of policy. But I mean, to be fair, you're going back to the 1980s, mm. uh, you know, when I was in that particular post. But, you know, I don't know very many organisations where the, certainly not smaller organisations, where the chief executive's salary is not known. I mean, even if you look in big public companies, now there's a move, uh, you know, to put, perhaps not name them, but put the salary range uh, of each of the posts and so that shareholders can get a, an idea. And I would have thought in a voluntary organisation, which is in effect what the SNP is, uh, members have a right to know, you know, just what level of salary people are receiving. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's also, again, we're into all sorts of rumours here, but it's definitely a change of policy. Um, you know, for at least the senior office bearers not to know. Now, I know because an ex-treasurer um, actually asked Colin Beatty that question, what does Peter Morell get? Mm. And the answer he got from uh, the treasurer was, I don't know. So he doesn't know. So we can't blame him for not telling us because he's out the loop. But, you know, how do, you, how do you say this? If I was involved in any organisation, be it a business or, a, a, you know, a, a, an enterprise or a political party, and people that were on the audit committee, the national treasurer, effectively, uh, were all being denied access to this information. Mm. And the only assurance you could get back was that uh, the, cha the treasurer who resigned was given the same access as the treasurer before him, <laughs> which was the treasurer where the money went missing, you know. Mm. This is not reassuring. That's, you know, a, a, a pretty fair point, I would say. It's not reassuring at all. And it seems to me also, and it's been suggested to me this morning, I'm not an expert in this, but it's been suggested that wording in point 10 mm -hmm. uh, might well be an insistence by the, the, the party's auditors uh, that that particular sentence is uh, in the accounts. In other words, the accounts are going to be qualified by the accountants and that's why he's mentioned that in the letter in point 10 because uh, it's been suggested to me that that's quite a clever move by the Treasurer to make that appear normal. But of course, if you have uh, accounts which are only qualified, or are not just put through, but have qualifications in them, that's quite a serious problem, or potentially a serious problem, if they're then to be sent to the, to the Electoral Commission. So... Uh, there may be more going on here than we know. But will these qualifications be made public, Ian? Will, will the public be able to see them? Yes, it's public account. So, I mean, if the auditor's uh, final report to the SNP uh, contains qualifications, they will be published. Even, did I hear you right saying that the treasurer of the SNP uh, has no idea what the CEO of the SNP is being paid? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's secret from everyone. How is that possible? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe because it's husband and wife. Maybe the party leader doesn't want you know, the rest of the party to know what her husband's getting paid. So who you know, allocates his salary? Some, someone uh, uh, somewhere must allocate his salary. Well, I mean, technically, it should be a matter for the national executive, but the national 
executive are more concerned about what dresses the men are putting on at the weekend than uh, whether, whether uh, you know, he's getting paid enough or, or less or whatever. There's, mm. There appears to be no financial oversight at all. I mean, the audit committee and the national treasurer are the people responsible through the, the national executive committee. Yeah. Now, none of these bodies have got access to the books, full access to the books. And that's why they resign. And I mean, we're not talking small, small fry people in the SNP. We're talking about one of the one of the auditors was the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, the SNP Lord Provost of Edinburgh, and a chartered yeah. accountant. Yeah. You know, now when people as you know that are involved professionally feel they can no longer continue because they're endangering, you know, their own financial reputation uh, and professionalism, then you know it's about time someday, somewhere surely, you know, took a hand in this. And the party members, I've been looking at the National this morning, you know, and, you know, there's, there's party members saying, oh, okay, so we spent some ring fence money, what does that matter? You know, <laughs> I'll tell you, it matters next time you go looking for any. <laughs> that, that, that's when you'll pay the price. But, I mean, you know, and they're just saying, so, oh, you know, we believe it's all been, it's all been squashed. The, chance, uh, the treasurer's statement makes it perfectly clear the money's still there. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Private in English, <laughs> it's making absolutely clear it isn't there. Okay. What is left is an IOU in the biscuit tin. Yeah. So it's the same thing as money. Yeah. Ian, how come that uh, there's no uh, uprising among MSPs and MPs? Surely in the past this was unacceptable. Uh, you know, you, you had individual members of the SNP who were not involved in this group think, who would have said, no, this isn't right. Let's get this sorted out. There seems to be no upsurge from, from 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 the elected representatives. Well, one of the reasons for that is that the people at the top of the party are all our pals. I mean, we have pals government in Scotland. We don't have a, a government, you know, selected by ability. Mm. It's very much a closed shop of her and her acolytes. Uh, and, you know, they've intimidated. The bottom line is they've intimidated the others into silence. If you want to have a career in the SNP, you need to go along with us or else you're out. I mean, she's been ruthless in the past and we've, uh, you know, ended it voice to any concern about anything. Yeah. So another, it's not a healthy another, situation. So another uh, uh, fundraiser next year, 2024 is the story. Um, yeah. I hope they don't spend too much in stamps because they might not get enough in to cover it. <laughs> I would do it. I would do it online. So where does that leave uh, uh, the upcoming Indiref? It's not going to be 2023 or 2024, is it? Well, no. But I, I mean, I don't think this particular financial problem, uh, you know, makes that any less less likely than it was to start with. I mean, I, I personally don't think you know there's any prospect in this parliament of another referendum unless Nicola Sturgeon and her acolytes are removed. And that seems a big ass, sadly, because she's been very successful in ensuring there's no obvious alternatives. Yeah. This is a huge scandal and it does not seem to touch her. They seem to have a sort of a Teflon coating, all of them at the top at the moment. Um... Yeah, well, the problem will eventually come. You know, you can't get away with this for any extended period. Because if the 2022 fundraiser, as an example, is against a background of no prospect of an NDRF, you know, then I think it will be an absolute flop. And I think they'll find it. Because even, even the real party loyalists that are turning a blind eye to this, they're not happy. Mm. They know there's something wrong. And they're not going to be going digging deep. And the other thing is they've lost a lot of people that were the folk that were the contributors. If you look, um, the Electoral Commission published quarterly reports on donations to the SNP. And I've got a spreadsheet going back the last 10 years. And it's quite clear that in the last seven, the numbers of people making big donations to the SNP have been you know, fading off until now. Yeah. Virtually there's very little. Yeah. And if you're worried about money and uh, how it affects Andy Ref, I would suggest that you, you should be more worried about the heavy reliance the SNP now have 
on the short money that comes from Westminster mm. because that's huge. I mean, it's well over a million pounds. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these high, high salaries and everything else are based around the availability of that money. And then you endanger that if you go for an India ref, yeah. referendum, yeah. you know. So, so the by the short is, money, you mean a percentage, a percentage of the MPs, uh, funds yeah, are, are allocated yeah. to the party. Yes, the party's given money. Some of it's restricted, but it's given to cover administration of being the third largest party uh, at Westminster. It's to cover things like research and various other things. And then, of course, the MPs themselves pay a proportion of their short money into the fund, which comes to the party as well. So, as I say, it's well over a million pounds a year. Uh, so it forms a, a significant amount of the party's income. And what I'm saying is that's a danger because the, the larger that percentage gets, the less likely that people are going to be willing to gamble on risking any of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we know we've got a risk-averse government at the moment, yeah. you know. So this would be, in my view, a step too far for them, I'm afraid. So that's encouraging people to settle down and not settle up in reality. Exactly. exactly. I mean, there's nothing that frightens Pete Wishart more than his pension in <laughs> Ian, <laughs> you at the Scottish Free Media have been uh, push, pursuing many of these things. Could you give the Scottish Free Media a wee plug here? I'd like, to, like you to tell people who may not know about it what it is. Well, it's a, it's a coalition of independent bloggers who have come together. I mean, it's a reaction in part to what's been happening to Craig Murray and, and to what Lady Dorian said in her judgment, where she regards bloggers as more liable, uh, you know, to prosecution than mainstream journalists, uh, because mainstream ju journalists are covered by the IPSO code, the voluntary code uh, that they operate. But I mean, either way you look at it, it's, it's really bad news. Sorry about that. Well, it's not, you, you can't come to this house without something happening, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit it's, disappointed it's, the dog wasn't active. <laughs> uh, that's the one he's floating about. It's, it's the dog's a star of the Sunday show. <laughs> that's uh, absolutely. More fans than me. Uh, where do you see it going? Do you see the police getting involved in this? Well, I hope so. I mean, that, that, that would be the best outcome. I, they, they certainly should. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the result will be at the end. The police do appear to be interviewing people, which is good news. Hmm. Uh, but I don't know uh, how many uh, they've interviewed, but I know they've interviewed the court. I believe they're still to go to see Douglas Chapman. Ah. They're probably doing all the interviews with everybody before they go to see him, I would imagine. Mm. But they have definitely uh, interviewed members of the audit committee that resigned as well. Mm. So, I mean, they seem to be taking it reasonably serious. Um, obviously, the big problem we've got is whether to decide to prosecute. <laughs> we'll go to the Crown Office <laughs> and it will be the Lord Advocates Department that have to decide they're based on his performance in recent times, I would be pretty sure he would give them a pass if he possibly could. Yeah, well, uh, he's, he's walking but, away from over a hundred million, possibly in damages uh, from his uh, malicious absolutely. prosecutions, which it seems incredible. That he can just walk uh, away from that amount of damage. Well, exactly. I mean, it's uh, I think from memory, it's about three quarters of his entire budget. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's going to have to be paid by the taxpayer from other funds. Uh, but it's astonishing, yeah. And I mean, it openly admitted as malicious prosecution, yeah. you know. And, but of course, he was never maliciously prosecuted when it was Alex Salmon that was the target. Oh, no, no, no. That's only when it's Rangers that you can own up to being <laughs> that type of person, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really is quite ridiculous. Ian, while I've got you here, just briefly, I know you're doing something for the Scottish Free Media a bit later today. What is it we can look forward to? 
There it was. Uh, there's a dog. It turned up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the, he thought he, he was panicking. He thought the show was ending there. We didn't get a mention. Uh, I'm interviewing Jim Sellers, and we are discussing uh, foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, because Jim feels that the SNP are very, very weak on it, and yeah. if we're ever going to become independent, we need foreign allies. Yeah. And we're also going to examine why, despite all the talking down in Scotland, why does Westminster still want to hold on to us? What's the reason <laughs> that they want to hold on? So I think it'll be a lively discussion. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going through a good period. That was a very good prison programme on Sunday with Alf Baird. Was, uh, the previous one, the Wednesday before, with my friend from Estonia, was excellent. very well received as well. Excellent. So we're on a sort of roll, so I'm hoping with my good compadre Jim will have a lively programme to keep that run going. Okay. Uh, it's very important that when people see articles coming from the Scottish free media, they share them and they promote them on their own pages, this, yeah. that and the other, because obviously we don't have the budget or the mainstream ma media. No. You know, so we're relying on our friends and our colleagues uh, to spread that message. You know, and when it's done properly, it can be very effective. I mean, uh, some days I can have twice the circulation of the national, for instance, <laughs> just out my own, just out my own blog. Yeah. So I mean, that's because of my readers sharing something that exactly. they thought was particularly worthwhile. Exactly. So I would urge people, you know, to get involved. It's not just us. We need our readers on our side as well yeah, and yeah. thanks to everyone that does yeah well that was the point of 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 my setting up the indy scott news twitter feed it's all automated every time you guys put up a yeah. new blog it's linked to it you know and it links to it several yeah. times so well, it's in one great. place and people you can know, find I mean, it well that's it you know and my dog's getting harder to find all the time <laughs> <laughs> ian thanks very much I'll good luck with jim this. sellers later today well, do. Look, I'll be very well, interested in what he says about NATO, particularly, and uh, EFTA and so on. I take it he's going to touch the political and the military. Oh, I hope so. Well, I'm getting him in the mood with uh, playing the a French orchestra at the beginning, playing the march to Robert Bruce. That's the one I use. A quick, yeah, and we're going to have a, we're going to have a quick uh, discussion about the Lebec letter, uh, mm. just to demonstrate that Scotland did have a foreign policy before yeah. the union. Yeah. And uh, what we need to do is get back to making those trade links, these diplomatic links ourselves, rather than going through the London operator. If you remember back to the old days, uh, the telephone, you may be too young, Peter, but you used to have to go, if you wanted to make an international call, you had to go through the London operator. Uh -huh. And it seems that all, despite all these uh, technological improvements over the years I've been alive. We went round in a big circle, and now London's trying to make us have to go through the London operator oh, yeah. if we want to talk to everyone, anyone abroad. Yeah. So what we've got to do is smash that phone and go. Yeah, so. But uh, a very and interesting point, Ian. Uh, when Nor when Norway went for its independence in 1905, the the crisis. That, 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 that led to that was one of foreign representation. The Norwegians wanted their own international representation abroad. They did not want to go through yeah. the Swedish diplomatic service. That led right. to a constitutional right. crisis, which led to Norway's independence declaration, followed by a, con a, a confirmatory referendum. Right. But it was I'm very interested. I'm glad you told me that, Peter. I'll use that tonight in the programme. 1905, a parliamentary declaration of independence against a backdrop of constitutional issues with reference to foreign representation. Right. And they just declared it. Mm -hmm. And a few months Fantastic. later, they held a Norwegian run confirmatory referendum, which was hugely successful. Yeah, that's right. It was a very big vote in favor of it. And Sweden backed down. There was the possibility of military confrontation. Obviously, Norway had its a slightly different form of, uh, you know, situation in Scotland was. Uh, the British forces in Scotland are not Scottish forces the way Norwegian forces were Norwegian forces back in 1905. But a very interesting uh, parallel, which I really think people should be thinking. Made aware of. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, you, will, I, I will put use it of course a few times. Ian, I, I won't keep you any longer. Away and feed oh, your nice. dog. <laughs> I'm going away to feed myself. That's <laughs> one Right. All the best. Dear. All nice the best, Ian. Take care. Ta-da. Bye.